Hi everyone, thank you for joining to another Restoration Fluid Mechanics Seminar Series. It's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Sherwin Bogri. He is a professor at KTH University. He is a Wallenberg Academy Fellow and one of the 20 recipients of the Future Research Leaders Grant awarded by the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research. His research group focuses on understanding how fluid flows and surface uh, behave and interact. Today, he's going to give us a talk on controlling and modeling transport phenomena using surface engineering. With this short introduction, I hand it over to you, Sherwin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Yes, you can hear me. You can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you very much, Shaham, and also for inviting me and uh, Kat for organizing this. Um, it's a very nice uh, seminar series you have, and I'm very glad to be part of it. And I uh, hope I can contribute with uh, diversifying the range of topics. So uh, the, uh, the title uh, is um, pretty broad, and it's about uh, basically looking into how surfaces and flows interact with each other. Uh, so you can, you know, there's a bunch of problems that are particularly interesting to look at if you want to look at interaction between surfaces and flows and here are four of, four of those uh, we have particles near solid uh, either soft solids or uh, complex surfaces we have separated flows here you see an image of a shark skin and uh, you know this is important uh, for for laminar flows and separated flows and wall bound, wall bounded turbulence is a classical problem um, in the presence of uh, roughness and also, uh, of course, of engineering importance is a transport phenomena of porous materials where the, uh, the microstructure of the porous materials very much affects the, the flow field around the porous materials. So these particular problems are interesting because if you change the surface properties, you are changing the flow dynamics significantly. And we are interested in, in these problems. And, I'm going to say something about all these four problems. So, of course, there's quite a big range of, of physics and scales uh, on these different topics, but the common denominator here is the, the surfaces. You know, how do we model surfaces and how do we extract and understand the physics by changing uh, surface properties? And in particular, you know, if we understand uh, the interaction between flows and surfaces, we can move on to engineer surfaces to control uh, these processes. Right. So, so this is from a system point of view. This is really the idea. You have uh, you want to change surface properties, being texture, wettability, elasticity, and you want to sort of you know look at what happens from an engineering point of view. If you look in particles, how do particles move near the surface? If you're looking into heat and mass transfer friction, what happens to those uh, transport coefficients as you change the surface? And clearly, you need a model for that. So, you know, if we exclude experiments in this talk and just think about uh, computations, there's essentially two ways of doing that. You can imagine that you resolve every scale of your surface and really uh, end the flow. So it's a fully resolved surface resolved model. Or you can imagine that you model the surface complexity with some boundary condition. For example, the most classical one is Navier slip boundary condition. So here you can see that to the right, you basically uh, linearly extrapolate your velocity profile at the surface to zero. Uh, and that extrapolation length, L, is your uh, slip length, right? So this is classical Navier slip boundary condition, which you can use and tune to somehow model some type of deviation of the surface from a perfectly smooth, no slip, canonical, ideal surface. So by doing these things, we can learn about physics and we can see how transport coefficients and other flow properties are modified. And really, this is the idea of this talk. Now I'm going to say a little bit, of course, it's very interesting to understand, and we have spent a lot of time on this, to understand how do you determine the appropriate boundary conditions of a surface. So if we actually have a physical surface, let's say with a given texture, how do I find out what kind of boundary conditions I need to impose 
to model that particular surface. And, you know, I'm going to say a little bit about this in the uh, second half of the talk, but that's not really the aim of this talk. It's not really to go in depth about that sort of upscaling to boundary conditions. It's more about looking into, you know, a few different problems where we see new physics and uh, we have new understanding of flow problems by changing surfaces. Right. So, you know, if you want to look at surfaces and flows, you need to talk about length scales. And um, so, you know, if you just look at the length scales of surface complexities, obviously at some point you have the molecular scales below continuum limit, and then you move up the scale ladder, you have protein, uh, you know, major thing on membranes, polymer brushes, you have plants, roughness on plants, leaves that are that are interesting to look at, and you have animals and their, their sort of, uh, uh, you know, skins. And you go up to engineering scales, you have fouling and other type of degradation of surfaces. And, you know, having these range of scales, of course, they are all not relevant for all flow problems. If we look at turbulence, clearly we don't care about the molecular scales and then no slip boundary condition is a very good model. You know, but if you start to look at laminar flows, we can span a larger range of scales where we might need to move away from no slip. Where we might want to model surface complexity somehow. Transporting porous media is even a larger span of scales. And you know, on the other sort of end, you have lubrication, where 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 there's a range of scales, which which is interesting. So these are actually, this is also actually, actually also the outline of the talk. So I'm going to say a little bit about all these problems. In particular, turbulence and lubrication, I'm going to talk about physics and, and you know, some new uh, things we have observed. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about modeling. How do you model complex surfaces in a very convenient way for CFD when it comes to laminar and transport and porous media? Uh, right, so, so let's get started. Um, so the first topic I'm going to talk about here is on the sort of uh, large scale uh, end of the uh, spectrum. So this is a collaboration with uh, uh, Stefan Saleski, who is at Sorbonne University. And also uh, the work has been performed by Yuan, who is a graduate student uh, in, in our group. And uh, this is, it should come out uh, anytime in JFM as a rapid uh, is, uh, is in production as we speak this work. So one of the surfaces that has inspired, uh, you know, surface engineering quite a lot is the uh, surfaces of, of the pitcher plant. And there's this sort of ridge, the peristome of this pitcher plant, which has this in interesting grooves, as you can see in the zoom to the right. And these grooves Basically, uh, you know, as soon as there's water around, either from rain or dew, these grooves get filled with water, and uh, you know, it becomes a slippery surface. And it's a pretty interesting surface because it is asymmetric. So if you put something into under the surface, it really slips in one direction only. And um, and this is the way for for this plant to basically uh, you know survive because as insects are attracted to, to, the, to the plant, they, they sit on the peristome and they slip into the uh, pitcher, and then they get sort of, you know, uh, dissolved by acid and the, is, is, is this food for the plant. So this has inspired, uh, you know, partly I would say, uh, surfaces which we call liquid infused surfaces. And this has generated a lot of interest in, in, in some areas. For example, in this ketchup bottle, on the glass, you have similar grooves, and those grooves are filled with a lubricant, which is a different liquid than the ketchup. And uh, due to that uh, lubricant, and which are infused in these grooves, you can have this nice ketchup. Uh, you know, you can use. Uh, you don't have any uh, sort of uh, waste of the ketchup. And uh, you know, we wanted to understand, uh, and not only us, other people has done this before us to understand if these liquid infused surfaces can be used for uh, reducing turbulent drag. And this is uh, something that people have done uh, experimentally, for example. Uh, for example, in the group of Smiths in Princeton, using a Taylor-Quet flow, you can get some sort of drag reduction around 10%. 
if you, for example, uh, infuse grooves with oil and then you have water as the turbulent flow, you can, you can achieve 10% drag reduction. Now, there's been some numerical works on this uh, problem as well. In those computations, it has been the interface. So you have a liquid-liquid interface between, for example, the oil and the water. And that interface has been treated in an ideal sense. So it has either been considered to be flat. That would basically mean uh, infinite surface tension. Or the, the interface, which is green here in this figure, has been assumed to be pinned to the solid. So it cannot really move freely. It's constrained uh, to the solid. So we relaxed these conditions and we want to understand how turbulence interacts with this liquid-liquid interface and if this movement of the interface can actually um, affect the turbulence somehow. So by doing uh, numerical simulations in a turbulent channel flow, as you see here to the right, uh, we could look into this problem. So we chose some you know, physically uh, relevant parameters. So you have two, two flu uh, liquids now. You have the water and, and the, for example, some alkane oil. And the water and the alkane oil, we assume they have the same density. Uh, so that would be rho i over rho infinity and uh, be one. And then we vary their viscosity ratio. So we just by, you know, a few, uh, 0 0.5, 1, and 2. And then we assume the contact angle between the oil, water, and solid is 45 degrees. So that would mean that um, the oil here likes the solid more than the water. So it likes to stay in, inside the grooves. And, you know, we have these grooves, which are basically approximately in width and height, uh, one-tenth of the channel height. And, you know, we have a typical surface tension that you have for oil water. And, you know, if you look at low Reynolds number of turbulent flows, which we can do numerically, that will correspond to maybe a water flow with one meter per second in a channel of uh, 0 0.5 centimeters. Actually, this is a water channel that we have in our facility where we look at some turbulent flows. Now, this would correspond to Reynolds number around 2,800. Uh, based on the bulk velocity and the Weber number, which is basically the ratio between inertia and, and surface tension, uh, we vary. So we go from 100, 150 to 200, all right? So this is the problem setup. Uh, and uh, this corresponds, if there's some turbulence people out there, to approximately red tau 180. So we set this up in uh, numerical code we have, which was originally developed by Stefan Saleski which is called Paris, is a standard finite volume solver. However, it has a volume of fluids to treat multiple phases. And what was really uh, new here, which we added, which made this possible was a dynamic contact angle, uh, which we sort of, you know, use hydrodynamic theory to do that. So now the contact between, so now <clears throat> the infused liquid can move freely. It can spill over, it can move to the grooves, <clears throat> it can go between the grooves and, and things like that. And, um, right, so what happens? So if we take a look at, from top view now on the surface, uh, so we're not showing the flow here, just the interface, which is in green. Uh, and, you know, for Weber number 100 and viscosity ratio one, this is what you see. So it's a pretty neat, uh, uh, well-organized interface. You have a little bit bulges here and there, but not, not really any, any dramatic uh, events here. And you get a drag reduction of 10% for viscosity ratio one. So this is uh, really what we expected from liquid infused surfaces. Now, if you increase the Weber number to 200, you see something else. You see sort of, you know, these big bulges here, uh, quite, quite uh, a lot of places, uh, you know, and you have basically the infused liquid coming onto the grooves. And, uh, you know, you, if this was a movie, you would see these bulges move downstream a little bit like the capillary waves, basically. And now the Weber number has been increased to 200. So basically we have, you can imagine that we have decreased the surface tension. So the interface is a bit, if you think of it as an elastic membrane, it's a bit softer now. So it's easier to deform, right? But Weber number 200 is definitely something you can observe in, in, in experiments and 
and also in applications. Now what happens due to these uh, sort of bulges of the interface is that the drag reduction is completely um, canceled. Actually, there's a slight drag increase, but basically it's drag neutral, I would say, compared to the smooth surface. So there's, a, there's obviously a big consequence of, of these, of these uh, interface shapes. And you know, we can take a closer look at this. So if we take a, a cross section in one of the grooves at the center of one of the grooves and just look at the amplitude of the interface, we see something like this. Now for, for web number 100, the top frame, you know, you, you sort of, you have these different lines which are showing at one point, uh, sorry, with, with uh, at, at along the streamwise direction, but at different instances in time, the sort of uh, interface height. And, you know, you, you see some sort of wave-like uh, uh, motion to the right. If you look at wave, uh, web number 200 on the bottom part, you see something similar, but you can see that the amplitudes here are reaching in inner units in viscous length scales around five, right? So, which they are not doing for web number 100. So we're reaching significant amplitudes of these waves. And if we look into this a little bit more quantitatively, so again, we look at these two Weber numbers. For low Weber numbers, we have some growth. This is now uh, uh, in time. We have a growth in time for a particular point in the, in, at the center of a, of a liquid infused uh, groove. We can see that there is an increase, a uh, little bit exponentially, but you know, it saturates and it decays well below amplitude of one. However, now for the web number 200, you, you see a clear exponential growth, you know, before it saturates. And the saturation, you know, it's outside of the viscous sublayer, just outside of the viscous sublayer. So you basically get a roughness effect here. And uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, the, the reason why we see this cancellation of drag reduction, which you expect for liquid infused surfaces. So in a way, is a failure mode of, of the surfaces when you have too soft uh, uh, or uh, too high Weber number. So we wanted to look into this a little bit more in detail. And uh, what we did is uh, we looked at uh, the instability here mechanism. So we looked at more carefully into one of these grooves and, and trying to understand really what kind of what's going on here. So clearly there's a, there's a, there's a lot of interfacial instabilities one can, one can look at, but we could directly exclude a few of them because we observe this also for density and viscosity ratios of one. So, you know, we don't have, this is not interfacial instability that arises because you have a, a variation of density or viscosity between the two liquids. So uh, there are other, uh, you know, uh, instability uh, theories out there, and one in particular which uh, we applied here, which you know solved this problem, is uh, surface gravity waves. Basically, the waves you see on the ocean, which are driven and uh, by the wind. So this is something that uh, you know there's inviscid stability theory uh, from uh, Miles. In, you know, in 1957, he published this in JFM where he used sort of the uh, inviscid theory and critical layer theory to explain how uh, the wind, the shear and the turbulence from wind can generate waves on, 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 on water. So we use that theory and we, we replace a little bit, uh, we sort of adapt that to, to our, our, our situation because obviously gravity is not interesting restoring force here. This restoring force, the stabilizing force here is the surface tension. So, you know, a little bit of manipulation of that theory, we could sort of look, adapt it and study our problem. So here, here just one slide on, on, you know, how it works. It, you know, it's a classical problem in linear stability. You start off with a, assuming that the perturbations are wave-like. So here, eta is the interface height. And we assume it has a wave form. Uh, and an amplitude a, but in time and space, it behaves like a wave. And the, the one interesting here is the confinement in the spanwise direction set by the groove width, right? So the groove width w here sets the maximum spanwise wavelength you can have. 
but then, of course, you have also this streamwise wave length, uh, lambda x, uh, and then you have the phase speed c. Now, c here is complex, and you know, this is what we are looking for to find c. The real part of, of c gives us the phase speed uh, of the wave, and the imaginary part gives us the growth rate of the wave. So by finding C, uh, we can sort of we'll find a condition for when the imaginary part of C is larger than zero, we can find a condition for when we, when we have these instabilities. And of course, we need to couple the flow to the interface. And you know, in the inviscid case, that would correspond to Laplace pressure or capillary pressure. So again, you know, the pressure difference across the interface, P plus and P minus, is equal to the curvature, so the second derivative of, of the um, eta, and also uh, the surface tension here, right? So this is the classical Laplace pressure. And uh, so, and how do we get the pressure? Well, we can solve the Rayleigh equation, right? So this is the inviscid or sommerfeld equation. Here we have, we solve for the wall normal velocity of the uh, flow, which is V, also is a wave-like uh, perturbation. And then we have the turbulent mean velocity profile, big U. And, uh, you know, by solving the Rayleigh equation, uh, we get V and having V, we can as a post-processing step, obtain the pressure. And once we have the pressure, we can put it into uh, our condition for capillary pressure and get eta. And then from eta, we can sort of, you know, pull out the uh, complex, um, uh, phase speed c and thus solve this instability problem. So this is basically roughly how we do it. Now one can solve this Rayleigh equation numerically. However, we did a, a we solved it by hand through some app, uh, through some approximations. Basically, exactly the same way as Miles did this in, in fifty seven before they had computers. And you get some additional insight by doing that. So you get basically expression for the for the real part, which gives you the phase speed here. So as you can see, the real part contains surface tension and groove width uh, and also density. But basically, the phase speed increases the smaller groove you have or the higher surface tension you have. So if you think of it as a really like a elastic ribbon kind of uh, material, you know, the higher surface tension you have, the more rigid it is, the faster waves uh, can travel on it. And uh, what is important here is to look at a particular uh, quantity, which, which is the critical layer velocity or the critical position of the critical layer. So there is a, once you have the speed of the wave, you can find a location, uh, a wall normal position away from the wall where the, uh, the phase speed equals uh, the velocity of the mean flow. So this is called the critical velocity and the position is called the uh, critical layer. So here, for example, you have what, this could be the position where you have the same phase speed as the mean flow. And this is, uh, you know, if you look at the Rayleigh equation, it's singular at this point and it is an inviscid equation and that's why you have singularities in it. And, you know, all the sort of viscous uh, contribution in terms of, uh, you know, physics is sort of, you know, squeezed into that singularity. So it plays, it plays a major role when you want to understand this instability mechanism, as, as I will tell you in a minute. So what, what you can do is uh, write this phase speed in terms of non-dimensional numbers, and, and it looks something like this. You, you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in plus units or inner or viscous units, you get the Weber number uh, and the, uh, width, right? So the Weber number with the plus sign means the Weber number where the inertia uh, is based on the vo uh, friction velocity instead of the bulk velocity. And uh, W plus here is the groove width normalized with the viscous length scale. So here basically we can see that if we increase the Weber number, for example, or if we increase the width, uh, or if we increase the friction velocity, any of these would increase, uh, uh, would decrease the phase speed. And that would mean that the critical layer moves closer to the wall, right? So the, the phase speed here uh, uh, sets the height of the critical layer. 
And this has consequences for the growth rate. This is really what we're interested in, right? When we want to understand why things grow and when they grow. So looking at the growth rate, you get this expression. We don't need to understand this expression. We're just you know, gonna look at this factor here, which I have marked in blue. And you can see that it contains uh, an alpha here, which is positive. You don't need to know what it is. It's just a positive uh, uh, constant. And then you, know, you have this part in the blue and uh, you have K, which is the absolute wave number is positive. You have UC prime, which is a derivative of the turbulent mean profile at the critical layer. And the, the shear, the derivative is always positive for a turbulent mean flow. So that one is positive. So the only thing you have here is the second derivative uh, of the, um, the velocity uh, profile. And that one needs to be negative such that the expression in, marked in blue here is negative such that you get a positive growth rate because you have a minus sign outside. And so this is a requirement for the instability that you need to have a negative curvature at the critical layer. And this is sort of a classical thing in critical layer theory to have a negative curvature. And you basically have this outside of the uh, viscous sublayer. Uh, negative curvature for turbulent profile. So if you're outside of viscous sublayer, you fulfill the requirement for an instability, right? So if we call this expression beta, this factor in blue as beta, we can see how it varies with the position of the critical layer. And this is what you see here. So again, we have yc here, or uh, non-dimensionalized with the wave number. Uh, and is a position of the critical layer. And you can see that sort of a huge, and this is logarithmic now. So you have a very, very uh, small uh, beta if you're far away from the wall. So uh, for example, in this region here, you have beta, which is smaller than 0 0.02. And then there's a sort of a gray zone where you know, there's a fast increase of beta. And then you have a very fast growth. So this factor becomes larger than one. So almost two orders of magnitude larger when the critical layer gets close to, to the wall. So obviously the position of the critical layer determines the factor in, this, in the growth rate, right? So this is basically the instability mechanism. If we put it together, what happens is that if you have a softer interface, well, maybe soft is not, is not elastic, it's, is a liquid liquid interface, but you can think of it as being more deformable, either by having a higher wave Weber number, so smaller surface tension, or if you make the grooves wider, then you basically get a lower phase speed, right? You see that from the expression we have here. So lower phase speed means that you are moving the critical layer more close to the solid, right? Uh, and what that means is that you're moving this sort of singularity in Rayleigh equation, which is really the source for transferring energy from the mean flow to, to, uh, to the interface, to the boundary conditions, which is the interface here, closer to the wall. And when you move it closer to the wall, you have dispersive stresses that are coming from the interface. And, and those are large, uh -huh. and this really results in a larger growth rate. So you can transfer energy from the mean flow to the interface and thus have, have, have these perturbations grow exponentially. And you know, so this is really a mechanism and you can put this, you can organize this into a design map for liquid infused surfaces on the turbulence. And this design map uh, basically can be used before you do experiments to know if you're gonna have capillary waves uh, or not. So if you have capillary waves, which are very, uh, you know, um, fastly growing, you will be in the rough zone here. So you will have no drag reduction. You will have a failure of your liquid infused surfaces. However, if you have, you know, if you're in the smooth part, you can expect drag reduction. So we did a bunch of different simulations at different viscosity ratios and, and, uh, and Weber numbers and uh, widths. And, you know, we see that, uh, so this is sort of gray zone here is given by the theory, which, which we just discussed, right? So you have two boundaries. In the gray zone, we don't really know what happens. Yeah, it's sort of a transition from smooth to rough. 
But if you are sort of on this lower side, you can see that you definitely have drag reduction up to 18% or 9% depending on the width and the weather number. But however, you know, if you move to the right, you, you gradually decrease drag uh, reduction or have a drag increase. So of course, you know, when you do experiments, you, you know your width of your grooves, you want to design and you can, you know, the surface tension uh, and you can sort of see where you are on this map. However, we should note that these are in inner units. So you also have the friction velocity, of course, affecting uh, the, the uh, Weber number and in plus units and width in plus units. So one, the design should be done for the maximum friction velocity that you expect to have. Right, so this is really the first part of the talk and um, I'm gonna just move on now to a completely different area. But we're seeing here an example of, you know, surface resolving everything, the complexity of the surface and having and seeing how it has a significant effect on the macroscopic uh, features of the overlying flow here it will be drag. And the importance maybe of not using idealized models here because you lose some of the physics. So if we were to use slip boundary condition or just a flat interface, we will not, we will not have discovered this uh, failure mode of the liquid infused surfaces. So uh, moving on now to completely different range of scales, you know, so again, I'm moving back and forth here for problems in terms of scales, but the common denominator is really surfaces and flows. So let's look at the lubrication problem. And this is a problem that we studied, uh, uh, you know, that was published in PRF recently, last year. It was performed by uh, Aiden, who was a graduate student in our group, and, uh, and uh, Ujis, who is a, a researcher in our group, who's been uh, working on, on uh, quite many things. And also our collaborator here is Thomas Sales, who is a CNRS, uh, uh, faculty in Bordeaux. Right, so <clears throat> let's start on, on this part. So <clears throat> the uh, lubrication, a classical problem, I would say, to understand how surfaces and flows interact is this problem. You have a wall and you have a particle and they don't make any contact but you know, they, there's, a, there's a thin gap between them here denoted by delta zero. And that the flow in that gap is modified as such that the forces on the particle are modified, right? So you can change the complexity of this problem by changing the properties of the wall, making it soft, porous, or inhomogeneous, or you can change the properties of the particle, either on the surface or its shape. And you, know, you get all kinds of different uh, behaviors and what is interesting is to understand how the flow around the particle is changed and consequently how the forces on this particle and the torque are changed uh, as a consequence of changing wall and wall and particle properties. So it's a con quite controlled way of looking into uh, fluids and surface interaction. Um, so this is a, you know, uh, what the simplest case, of course, is if is you have a perfectly smooth cylinder, a perfectly smooth wall, so you have no slip everywhere, and, and the cylinder has a imposed parallel velocity to the wall, so it's just moving with a constant velocity. Now what happens, but it's otherwise free to translate and rotate, so it can go up and down or it can rotate. But what happens is that if, if you, you know, solve the hydrodynamic equations here, the cylinder just moves parallel to the wall. There is no wall normal display, displacement, which for me was surprising because you know, I would have expected that the presence of the wall would somehow disturb the symmetry of the flow around the cylinder and you know, create some sort of an asymmetric um, uh, flow and thus some sort of a normal force or in some direction. But this is not the case. So it really has zero wall normal displacement. As long as the Reynolds number is low uh, and the gap thickness is small compared to the radius of the cylinder, under these conditions, there is no wall normal displacement. And this was explained by Reynolds in 1886, actually. So this is basically the same problem. It just has the opposite sort of a mirrored you know, image so you have the cylinder on the bottom here, it's moving to the left 
and on the top you have a fixed plate, parallel fixed uh, plate. And you know what you see here is a, is a combination of quet and price solve flow, right? So you have a quet because one boundary is moving with a constant velocity, but you also get a price solve flow because you have a varying gap thickness. So you know to enforce mass conservation here, you, you will have to induce a pressure gradient. So you get these parabolic shaped profiles. And the pressure gradient would vary with, with the X, so to speak, with the gap, uh, where you are in the gap. And, you know, and it varies as a sinus curve. So it's anti-symmetric. You can do this by hand and Reynolds did that. And of course it is anti-symmetric. So if you want to compute the normal force, you will integrate this pressure and project it into a normal direction. And then you will get zero because it's anti-symmetric. So this is really a why there's no wall normal displacement. Now, so the question we asked is, well, you know, what happens if some, we disturb the surface, one of the surfaces, either the cylinder or the wall? So here the blue, for example, is some sort of a disturbance of the surface property. So it could be a roughness, it could be surface charge, it could be wettability. And I think it's pretty clear that, yeah, we, we break the symmetry here. So there will now be a wall normal displacement. So we can anticipate that, and that is also what happens. However, we were interested in understanding exactly how this happens, and, and if it's important, is this something we need to take to, into account when we study you know, problems in biology and soft matter, for example, in cells and, and uh, bubbles, drops, grains, and fibers near surfaces. So what we did is, uh, okay, before I, I move on, let me just discuss a little bit our model for disturbing the surface here. So one measure of, of uh, surface complexity is the contact angle, right? So if you take a solid and a liquid and you place the liquid and the solid, you will reach an equilibrium. And uh, you can measure the angle formed between the three phases, so liquid, vapor, and solid, and theta here is the contact angle. And this contact angle depends on the properties of the liquid and the solid. So uh, if you have surface charges, if you have some small roughness, if you have some uh, varying chemistry or temperature, you will have different contact angles. Also, you know, we talked about the slip length before as the extrapolation length of, of the nav of, you know, we take a profile and you extrapolate it to zero, the Navier slip length. It turns out that the contact angle is, if you change the contact angle, you change the slip length. So this, these are both experiments and molecular dynamic simulations, where you can see that, you know, they change the, the, for different liquids and solid, you get different contact angles, and you can also measure the slip length uh, experimentally, and, and you, you can see that the ex um, slip length also changes. So the point here is that if you change charge, roughness, or chemistry, you will change the contact angle. And then consequently, you will change the slip length, right? So a model for any sort of property change uh, of a surface uh, could be, or is, and this is the one we used, is that if you go from slip to no slip, basically you go, you have a varying slip length. So this is what we did. We, we, we said, let's have a slip on one region and no slip on one region and see what happens. And um, it actually, a, a lot of non-trivial things happen to the particle. So here we did a surface patterning. So you have slip, no slip, slip, no slip. And you have a particle falling due to gravity parallel to this wall. And what happens is that you get this sort of a, a push and pull behavior, right? So whenever you go from slip to no slip, the cylinder is pushed away, there's a normal force, the pressure symmetry is broken. And then when you go from slip to no slip, you have a pull force. So it goes back and forth like that. And, and the interesting thing is also that the push force is slightly larger than the pull force. So you know, over a very long time, you have a net migration away from the wall. So basically you're moving uh, 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 you know, away displacement and net displacement away from the wall so you know you can have fun you can play around with these things we did a lot of different problems one one more interesting thing i can show is we we change the surfaces on uh, uh, from slip to no slip on the cylinder now instead of the wall and then we uh, had the imposed rotation on the cylinder so this is a what is called a janus particle 
So if you impose a rotation, but otherwise the cylinder is free to do whatever it wants, uh, you kind of see the spiraling motions here. So it starts to spiral, and then it's also net migration. So again, you know, you break the symmetry. And uh, this is all fun, you know, and, 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 and nice, but we wanted to see if this is actually important and if there are any consequences of this. So what we did is that you can actually solve this problem um, analytically if you place the cylinder exactly at the transition point from slip to no slip, you can solve uh, the lubrication equations by hand. And once you have those uh, equations, uh, solutions, you can you know, do a Taylor expansion and you get a scaling. So the scaling for the normal force, it, it looks like this, right? So you have the viscosity of the fluid, eta. You have the velocity of the cylinder, V, which is imposed, which is parallel to the wall. And then you have the radius, R, and then you have the slip length, which is also imposed, is a property of the surface, L, and the gap thickness is inversely proportional to gap thickness to the power of two. So, you know, if you have, if you know a little bit, if you know your liquid properties and surface properties and velocity, you can sort of estimate this normal force. And a very classical uh, uh, lubrication force that's been studied a lot is normal force induced by soft walls. And you know, uh, in an analogous way, you can derive a scaling for the normal force of that problem. And you have similar quantities. Also the young model this here comes in, E. And um, you, you basically, you know, this is a quite of a well-studied problem because a lot of tissues and biological walls are soft. And we wanted to see whether this force that is due to chemical contrast, for example, <clears throat> can, be, <clears throat> excuse me, can be significant enough uh, to compete with this more classical elastro, elasto hydrodynamic force. So here's an example of that elastrodynamic uh, force uh, where, where you can see the cylinder is, is sort of moving uh, due to gravity down an inclined plate. Now, when you have a soft PDMS layer, it moves very quickly. When you remove this uh, soft layer, it sort of sticks and moves, uh, and moves very uh, uh, you know, slowly. So basically due to the soft wall, you have a displacement of the cylinder because you have a normal force and you get away from the wall so you can move faster. And, you, know, you have a gap thickness of 0 0.3 millimeters and that basically gives you a elasto hydrodynamic force, which is five millinewtons per meter. So if we were to have five millinewtons per meter for our problem, what kind of a variation of slip length would we need? Well, 20 nanometers. So if you have a change in 20 nanometers of slip length on a surface, you would generate the same normal force as you can generate with a soft uh, wall. And 20 nanometers, it's, it, it maybe it might not be small, it might not be big, you know, from an engineering point of view, macroscopic point of view, but from a surface chemistry point of view, it certainly is big. You can imagine a variation of temperature uh, easily generating this sort of change. Uh, so uh, we think that this is important uh, force that needs to be reckoned with uh, and it competes with other lubrication forces. So here again is an example, I would say that we have something very small, uh, microscopic uh, of property of a surface that generates and modifies something very macroscopically um, and something we can observe, for example, the, the cylinder here. Right, so now I've talked about two problems at, uh, you know, with very different length scales uh, where we have surface and fluids interactions and where surface engineering is important. Now uh, I will move on a little bit on to the uh, uh, modeling part. All right, so this is a little bit different now. We, I want to discuss how can we model complex surfaces. And this is a work we have done for, for quite some while uh, and it's been driven mainly by Ujis Lassis, uh, who is a senior reach, researcher at KTH. And also former postdocs have been involved here are Sudakar, who is in India now, and Simon uh, Pash, who is at um, in, in, in uh, Switzerland, All right? And we have published the, the talks that I'm going to talk about now 
uh, sorry, the, the, what I'm going to say now is published in, in, in these two papers here. You see JFM uh, transport in porous media. So uh, one uh, particular interesting question we started asking a few years back was, you know, we have these two ways of doing surfaces, uh, complex surfaces. Can we go between them? So if we have a given complex surface, can we find out what boundary conditions we need to impose uh, to, in average sense, uh, modify the overlying flow in a similar way as if we would have the real physical surface there, right? This is what we call upscaling. And the short answer is, yes, you can do this uh, for separated laminar flows over texture surfaces. Uh, you can do this also for transport into porous media, which is, you know, has a major engineering uh, uh, um, and particularly for fuel cells and tissues and, you know, it's important to understand how you, things move from outside fluid into a porous material. Now, we try to do this also for turbulent flows and we managed to do this uh, for small scale textures. Uh, you know, for turbulent flows, if you have a K plus below 15, so pretty small textures, you can represent the surface texture with the inhomogeneous boundary condition semi-empirically. It's not as these two first ones are completely non-empirical. So there are no free parameters you need to tune. Whereas for turbulent flow, there's one parameter we need to fit. And this is something we are, we are going to uh, publish soon. So the idea is the following. So imagine that you have a, you know, you have a shark, for example, and you want to compute the flow around the shark. And uh, it's, it's a small shark, uh, so you can imagine it's, it's mostly separation here, that uh, laminar separation, for example. And, you know, there's a, we know that the texture of the shark looks something like this. You have these denticles, uh, and they look different at different parts of the shark, but you have these big patches where they look the same. And we know that th these textures are important. So they, they modify a drag, a friction, you know, they have anti-fouling properties and so on. So we want to take that into account. Now, what we would like to do, the idea is to take one of these textures and analyze them. So one, uh, one, one of these, uh, you know, solve the flow around one of them, and then in appropriate way, average that flow, uh, sorry, so we get the slip length. So here is the slip tensor. I'll be talking about the slip length before, but you know this is more general. In three D, you have a slip tensor. I will say a little bit more about that in a few seconds. So anyway, what you do is that you analyze the surface, uh, the flow around one of these, and you get the slip length uh, tensor. And once you have that, you basically uh, put that into your favorite Navier-Stokes solver uh, with the inhomogeneous Navier uh, boundary condition with the slip length. And that would basically generate the flow field around this shark in a similar way as if you would resolve the flow around each of these uh, scales. But of course, this is much more convenient to have inhomogeneous boundary condition. And, you know, we, we, we tried this and, uh, okay, so maybe uh, before I said this, this idea is not new, you know, and, and you can look at the, uh, and it, it's not sure it makes, you have to be careful, you know, if it actually makes sense. So if you look at the, this problem, so here I'm just showing a channel, channel here with the bottom uh, groove, which is sinusoidal, and you have uh, the fast flow UF here. And then you can associate the slip velocity here. So if you take the average velocity at this red plane, it will be non-zero and that's the slip velocity. And, you know, if you just go through the Navier boundary condition, you can say that the slip velocity is sort of the characteristic length of the surface L, for example, the groove height over the channel height, right? And usually if the groove height is much smaller than the channel height, we can call this epsilon. So you have this sort of relationship between the fast flow UF and the slip velocity through epsilon. So people have looked at this. Richardson in 73, he actually solved this problem analytically. And he, he was interested in showing that no slip is a really good condition, even if you have, uh, if you have roughness. So he said that you know, in practice, epsilon is much smaller than one. 
And so no slip is a, is a good condition, even if you have some small roughness. And that's true, uh, of course, but he sort of, you know, he didn't think about the idea. He, he looked at epsilon as some sort of asymptotic uh, parameter. However, it doesn't have to be so small. And we can sort of think of it as, uh, as using the slip to model roughness. And this is what, you know, people have done when it comes to riblets. For example, Lucchini managed to, you know, explain the drag reducing effect of riblets by using effective boundary conditions or the slip boundary conditions <laughs> and also predict uh, the drag reduction. So is that, this is a good example of, of replacing a boundary condition with, uh, uh, sorry, replacing a real surface with a boundary condition. And also in chemical engineering, you have people looking at mixing uh, in, in, you know, in uh, small channels where they explain their observations uh, based on a slip and effective slip where they have grooved surfaces. So, so it makes sense uh, and you can sort of ask this question, but I think it has not really been formalized and, and you know, put into a, a more like a method, method to, to be used in CFD. So we did a lot of problems. One problem I can show here is the backward facing step. So we have a flow here coming from left to right. Uh, and you know, you, you get a sort of recirculation zone just behind the step. And we, we, we put roughness at the bottom. So this sawtooth kind of roughness. So here again, epsilon is not very small, right? So you have something like 0 0.1. So it's just 10 times smaller than the channel height or channel half height rather. And you know, if you put this roughness there and you solve the full DNS. So you actually solve the full, the flow everywhere, even inside and around, uh, around these roughness elements. You sort of, you know, you get the big separation bubble here. So you see you have this separation zone. And if you zoom in a little bit in this white square here at the bottom, you zoom in, you can see that you also have a separation inside the surface roughness here, right? So, and, and um, you, if you take now a plane on the tip of this uh, sawtooth roughness, and you look at the velocity, the streamwise velocity, and you look at how it varies with the streamwise direction, you can see that due to the roughness, you have a modification of this velocity, right? So in the smooth case, you have a separation, which is down to six in X or H. When you have roughness, you know, you, you still have the same length of the separation bubble, but it's reduced in, in magnitude somehow, which is shown by the black line. So the question was, you know, this is basically the idea. Can you now take this and replace this instead of resolving the flow around each roughness? Let's just put a, a plane there. And on that plane, we change the boundary condition from no slip to slip. And then can we modify the flow in exactly the same way? And yes, we can do that. And this is shown here by the blue curve that basically having that um, slip boundary condition, we can get exactly the same behavior. Uh, as, as if we would solve the flow around each roughness element. So the point here is that uh, there's no fitting parameters here, and I'll come back to that. So just to make sure, uh, yeah, we can basically skip the slide, but here we need to talk about the slip tensor. You know, you have multiple components of a, of a, of a slip here because it's 3D and the roughness, is, the roughness does not have to be aligned with, with the flow direction. But the point here is that, uh, you only need to look at one roughness to get the slip length. So here is, for example, cylinder, cylindrical roughness. Uh, we create a small computational box around it. And then we have to make certain assumptions. We have to make sure it's periodic. So it repeats itself in, in all the wall parallel directions. There's a scale separation, right? It doesn't have to be huge actually. So a factor of 10 is fine. And then you need to have a small flow. So it, it has to be smaller. It doesn't have to be very, very small. We also have done this with inertia. Up to Reynolds number 100, it works quite nicely. So once you have this, you, you can solve the Stokes equations in this small computational box and pull out the, uh, all the components of the slip length tensor. And then you can put that into your DNS, right? So uh, I think this is an interesting method. And we have tried you know, complex shapes. So we took a, a sharp denticle and we computed the slip lengths which are really, you know, when, this is for when you put the interface at the tip of the shock denticles here. So you get the slip lengths in different directions, X and Y here. 
And of course, you can put this into your DNS to model the effects of a shock skin, but it's also an interesting measure of the surface itself, right? So, so having uh, basically the slip length is inversely proportional to the resistance imposed by this uh, roughness on the flow. So for example, if you, here you can see that in the span wise direction y, the slip length is smaller than in the stream wise direction, which means that the resistance in the span wise direction is larger than the resistance in the stream wise direction. So um, uh, this is why also we think that these uh, structures might have some drag reducing um, properties. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, just to summarize, uh, we can say that uh, these um, structures, you know, when you have low Reynolds numbers, there's no really reason if you're doing DNS to resolve each structure. You can very efficiently and uh, non empirically find boundary conditions. And you can, you know, extend this to heat and mass transfer and also transport in porous media. When it comes to turbulent flows, uh, you know, it come, becomes semi empirical. And uh, you can do it, but you cannot do it for very large roughness. So probably other nonlinear methods uh, needs to be investigated to, to have a similar sort of upscaling for, for uh, turbulent uh, flows. Right, so I will stop there. And, you know, I just want to finish up with this slide and thank my group and my collaborators, which have made this possible and also the funding agencies. And, you know, we are interested in anything that has to do with surface and fluids. So if you have anything uh, you know you want to please reach out to us you can find all our work and some other things at our web page here bagurigroup.com thank you now we'll stop there thanks Shervin. perfect it was a very nice start and i open the floor for question if there is any please unmute yourself and ask your questions why people are gathering they thought I might ask a couple of questions <laughs> about your yeah. falling down particles with gravity how does the diameter of the particles which the initial distance from the wall influence this cooling and pushing periodic motion so you mean how the gap thickness yes. how yeah yeah so you need to be in the lubrication limit so you need to have a gap thickness, which is at least an order of magnitude smaller than the radius okay. of, of your cylinder. So you need to be close to the wall. So if you move away one radius away from the wall, let's say, uh, then, then you don't see this effect. Yeah. Any questions? I might go for the second one if there is no more. Okay. Hi, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Shervin. Doug Smith here from uh, the US Air Force. Hi. Um, nice talk. Uh, have you thought about trying to sort of do sort of the reverse problem? If somebody was this, if you were to specify for a given shape, how you might want to um, say transport properties to vary around that? Can you do sort of a sort of a design optimization to determine right. what say the slip length might be? Right. So you want to sort of, you know, uh, design a surface, yeah, going the other direction, right? So yeah, we we are very interested in this, you know, and we one way of doing this would be topology optimization. So basically, you know, it's a sort of a uh, framework of of uh, optimizing surfaces and materials to achieve something, and one can do that. I think it's a very hard problem to do that, though. Um, yeah, but I think in principle, it's possible. But again, I think we have problems. So that would be the inverse problem. But I'm, we are more interested now in the forward problem, moving towards turbulence and trying to understand. Uh, you know, I think the current CFD tools that we are using in industry now, that we don't really have uh, uh, well validated and models for boundary conditions or wall models in general. Uh, I think uh, atmospheric boundary layers is extreme length scales, but that's a good good example. But also, if you have any kind of roughness, uh, also in laminar conditions, you know, if you go to commercial software, you don't know what boundary conditions to put. So I think a good impact would be to actually sort of uh, do the forward problem, just be able to model 
surface complexities with a boundary conditions that have parameters that we can make sense of that are actually physically relevant, like the slip length, but there are other parameters and other boundary conditions, which I didn't talk about today. Uh, then I think the inverse problem, then, yeah, we sort of want to do that first and then move on to the inverse problem. But there's definitely methods out there that can do the job, I think. It would be very interesting to do that too. And I have talked to some people about that uh, to, to do that, yeah. Uh, what's this? Yeah, Shervin, nice talk. Thanks very much. Um, Hi, Vasil. Have you uh, made any thoughts about uh, applying these ideas to high-speed flows? Do you find do do you expect any um, challenges there? Yeah. So uh, you mean compressible, or in particular, or you think? Yeah. 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 No, we have not, and I, I think that would be very interesting to do that. Uh, and I think, um, uh, yeah, that would be uh, something we have not looked into. I, I imagine challenges, yes, uh, similar as we have for turbulence. So I, I think one could, uh, I think even a semi-empirical, I think, you know, for when we have linear, all the stuff I presented today is based on a linear theory. Uh, and, uh, and you can go to laminar and separation, separation too, because you know, even there, it's not linear, but it, there's no dramatic changes. If you have a separation bubble, it sort of changes in size if it's Stokes or laminar, but not uh, it's not dynamically completely different. So uh, there, we have this linearity assumption that we exploit to really get fully non-empirical, and that's beautiful. But I think if you want to do more engineering, uh, you need to, you, it's not going to, you're not going to get away with that linearity assumption. And there, uh, you're probably going to become semi-empirical somehow. So my, my idea is that probably we can come pretty far with making some connection to a physical surface, but there needs to be some experimental data or some, something that feeds into the models to, uh, to, to you know, make them accurate. And I think that will be the case for compressible flows too somehow. That's my feeling. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of explaining physics, well-known physics of uh, different behavior of instability modes in high-speed flow. You know what I'm talking about, right? So. Yeah. Yes, I think that one, that one, yes, if, you, if you're doing that, you're sort of assuming a linear, linearization because you're doing linear stability analysis. Uh, that one could be easier to, to do, yes, yes. Okay, uh, well, let's yeah. talk about it, thanks. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I lost everyone here, but uh, let me see. Um, so there, oh, there we go. more questions um, i might ask more one or two more questions yeah please uh, about your temporal growth exponential temporal growth in your three phase simulation you went to weber number of 200 and you had some other weber numbers how those going to be affecting the temporal growth or special or exponential growth in your temporal condition. So how do you mean other Weber numbers? What do you mean by that? A few other Weber numbers in one of your plots. You did the simulation for other Weber numbers, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Increasing the Weber number is going to affect your the exponential growth, temporal spatial growth. Yeah. So, so the higher Weber number you have, uh, the... Uh, uh, the lower phase speed you get, and the lower phase speed you get, you know, uh, the more prone you are to instability growth. Basically, you move. So you know, you can think of this physically as you know, you're just basically doing a softer interface, and it, it moves slower and it wobbles more, and they, they can grow more. And you know, we formalize this by talking about the energy transfer through the critical layer, but you know, it sort of. Um, it sort of obscures maybe just the simple physics is that you can just think about that. You're just making it softer so you can just wobble more. And that happens when you increase the web number. Yeah. 
One more question about your uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> back to step simulation. You're using a uniform roughness. How is going to be the behavior? How is going to change if you're using non-uniform uh, roughness? And if you are moving the roughness after the separation or just having it before the separation point? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. So I think, um, yeah, those are two questions. So first, if you move away from this perfect, you know, uh, repeating structure, you can do that. And there's two ways to do that. So if you have an irregular structure, so it's not random, but you basically just have, a, you know, patches of things repeating itself. Uh, then you can just expand this unit cell, this small computational box, which we took for one texture. You can just take and have maybe 50 textures, right? And then, you, and then that, that, you would, that would be a representative elementary volume so, uh, of that uh, surface. So that's one way of doing that. And, and you know, it would, it would work. Uh, and then the other one is just to do some statistical method. So you, you, you talk about, you know, and that will be purely random surface. Again, you can do these things. Uh, if, if it's linear, you still, you know, since you can do these things. Yeah, we haven't done it though. Now, and then, and then if you want to have like, uh, yeah, you can definitely, but the other question is, of course, of course, if you want to have smooth wall and a rough wall and a 